the so-called real economy is equally immaterial, and so in, in, much, in many ways corresponds to the so-called fictional character of finance already. Um, he, record, he, he, he warns against dismissing finance as merely unproductive in contrast to the image of productivity roughly tied to industrial production. It's more useful to situate finance, I think, in the context of the general trend from profit to rent and the correspondingly external position of capital with respect to the production of the common. Finance expropriates the common and exerts control at a distance. Now I can bring to a close and review the primary points of my reading of this first part of Marx's, Marx's thing, and I'll be more brief with the second one, don't worry. Um, the, uh, so what I wanted to come back to, Marx's passage in which he describes the struggle between two forms of property, like I said, it was in that case immobile versus mobile property, and the historical passage from the dominance of landed property to the dominance of industrial capital. That was Marx's point. So today I'm claiming we're experiencing a struggle between two forms of property, material versus immaterial, or scarce versus reproducible. And this struggle reveals a deeper conflict between property as such and the common. Although the production of the common is increasingly central to the capitalist economy, I'm claiming capital cannot intervene in the production process and must instead remain external, expropriating value in the form of rent through financial and other mechanisms. As a result, the production and productivity of the common becomes an increasingly autonomous domain, still exploited and controlled, of course, but through mechanisms that are relatively external, as I've been saying. So like Marx, I would, I would say this development of capital is not good in itself and the tendential dominance of immaterial or biopolitical production carries with it a series of new and more severe forms of exploitation and control. In other words, it's no paradise to work in a call center. I'm not saying that, that, this, that these forms of immaterial production are in some ways better. In fact, they, they do, like I'm saying, contain, contain m m more dramatic and, in some cases, severe forms of exploitation. And in fact, Marx's notion of alienation, which never made much sense to me, makes more sense to me in this context. In fact, uh, Arlie Hochschild, who I was referring to before, in her book called The Managed Heart, which uses flight attendants as a central example, she proposes the notion of alienation here because it's that alienation of what's most intimate to us, our, 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 our ability to love, our ability to, 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 to produce friendship that is being commanded and, 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 uh, and, and controlled. So that, in fact, I'm saying this is, it's not that this is in, in itself good or liberatory and in fact involves some horrible forms of, of exploitation and, and control or think of it as alienation. And yet it's important to recognize that I will argue that capital's own development provides the tools for liberation from capital, and specifically here, it leads to the increased autonomy of the common and its productive circuits. That's what I'll come back to. So that brings me to the second passage in the manuscripts I want to talk about. So the first one I had, I had told you before, I had, I had previously thought was boring, and now I found interesting. You might still find it boring. But the second one I found obscure, and now I find comprehensible. So here's the obscure one. Um, and it's in a section called uh, Private Property and Communism. One of the few, one of the few parts, one of the few uh, places in Marx's work where he talks about communism um, and tries to give an explanation of it. So um, I think that the notion of the common helps understand what Marx means in this passage by communism. That's what I'm going to try to explain. So here he starts saying this. He writes, communism is the positive expression of the abolition of private property. So he includes the phrase positive expression in part to differentiate communism from the false or corrupt notions of, of the concept. Crude communism, he claims, this is a large part of, the, of, the, of, the, um, of this section. After he, after he poses that definition, he goes into a large section, two pages, which seems large for this section, about crude communism. And he says that crude communism is merely, it merely perpetuates private property by generalizing it and extending it to the entire community as universal private property. So that crude communism institutes universal private property. That term, of course, is an oxymoron. If property is now universal, extended to the entire community, it's no longer really private. What he's trying to emphasize, it seems to me, is that in crude communism, even though the private character has been stripped away, property, the property character remains. Communism properly conceived instead is the abolition, not only of private property, but property as such. So, uh, 
Right, this brings me to the sentence that seem, has seemed to be most significant in this whole part. Marx writes, private property has made us so stupid and one-sided that an object is only ours when we have it. What would it mean for something to be ours when we don't possess it? What would it mean to regard ourselves and our world not as property? Has private property made us so stupid that we can't see that? It seems to me that Marx is searching here for something like the common. The open access and sharing that characterizes the use of the common are outside of and in inimical to property relations. We've been made so stupid that we can only recognize the world as private or public. We've become, in a sense, blind to the common. Now, I would go on here, but and maybe this would be the kind of thing for discussion, to think about the ways in which I, I think it's useful to try to think further about the ways in which property and property relations define our notions of subjectivity, also our notions of love and relationships. Um, yeah, I was thinking, for instance, of uh, Kolontai, Alexandra Kolontai, uh, in her arguments for the abolition of the family. Kolontai wanted it to have, in the 1919 uh, platform, she wanted, a, uh, she wanted to include a clause for the abolition of the family in the Soviet platform. Lenin struck that out. But, um, but what, she was, uh, what she's objecting to in the family is the family is essentially a property relation. It's a, it's a property relation of men possessing women and of thinking of love as a relation of property, the view of you possessing the other. You can even think of the notion of the subject. Here I'm thinking of the C.B. McPherson book, The Possessive Individualism, that the modern liberal notion of the subject is about the subject that is not only able to possess rights, but to be able to possess its person. Thinking of property in that sense, too. So uh, this would require, I think this is the challenge that Marx is thinking, or the challenge of the abolition of property is to, just, is to be able to organize our lives outside of property relations. It seems to be a large challenge. Okay. Marx does arrive at a version of the common as the abolition of property some 20 years later in volume one of Capital when he defines communism as the result of capitalist negative dialectic. This is the one part in Capital where Marx does talk about the future and, and communism. And this is what he writes. And I'm, I'm thinking this does give some notion of the common. So here's Marx's dialectical formulation of it. The capitalist mode of appropriation, the result of the capitalist mode of production, produces capitalist private property. This is the first negation of individual private property as founded on the labor of the proprietor. The capitalist production begets, with, an, with the inexorability of a law of nature, its own negation. It is the negation of the negation. This does not reestablish private property for the producer, but gives him individual property based on the acquisition of the capitalist era, that is, on cooperation and the possession in common of the land and of the means of production. So here we have, if you even try to uh, read out the dialectical part of this, uh, the results of capitalist production, that is cooperation and possession in common of the lands of the means of production, are what provide the possibility of communism. The common here is that. Capitalist development inevitably results, he will, he's arguing here, in the increasingly central role of cooperation and the common, which in turn provides the tools for overthrowing the capitalist mode of production and constitutes the basis for an alternative society and mode of production, in other words, a communism of the common. What I find dissatisfying about this passage from Capital, though, um, aside from its dialectical construction, is that the common Marx refers to, the cooperation and the possession in common of the land and the means of production, grasps primarily the material elements in question, the immobile and movable forms of property made common. This formulation doesn't grasp, in other words, the dominant forms of capitalist production today. But if we look back at the passage in the early manuscripts, and try to filter out Marx's youthful humanism, we find a definition of communism in the common that does highlight the immaterial or really biopolitical aspects. So let me go back to the passage in the, in the earlier manuscripts. Consider first this definition of communism which Marx proposes after having set aside crude communism. He writes, communism is the positive supersession of private property as human self-estrangement. And hence, the true appropriation of the human essence through and for man. It is the complete restoration of man to himself as a social, that is, human being. And let me read it again just because I know how it's hard it is to listen to things. 
I'll, I'll read the passage again. Communism is the positive supersession of private property as human self-estrangement. And hence, communism is, the true appropriation of the human essence through and for man. It is the complete restoration of man to himself as a social, that is, human being. So what does Marx mean here by the true appropriation of the human essence through and for man? Clearly he's working on the notion of appropriation against the green, applying it in a context where it no, now seems strange, no longer appropriation of the object in the form of private property, but appropriation of our own subjectivity, our human social relations. Yes, you see, uh, that's what I'm referring to where he says, the communism is the true appropriation of the human essence through and for man. Um, Marx explains this communist appropriation, this non-property appropriation, in terms of the human sensorium and the full range of creative and productive powers. Here's his most lyrical formulation of it. He says, man appropriates his integral essence in an integral way, which he explains in terms of all his human relations to the world, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, thinking, contemplating, sensing, wanting, acting, loving. I think the term appropriation here is misleading because Marx is not talking about capturing something that already exists, but rather creating something new. This is the production of subjectivity, the production of a new sensorium. Not really appropriation then, but production. If we return to the text, we can see that Marx does in fact pose this clearly. This is the last